Road Ministries. <laughs> Evie told me I needed to say it a little slower so that it didn't sound goofy. It sounded like awkward ministries. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, welcome to Off Road Ministries. We actually have, for the first time, all of our board members together. This is Jacob. I am Edie. Jacob. <laughs> Edie or Edith or Faith, whatever, a.k.a. Faith. Myself, Trina, and we have Chris and Amy Gossman down here. What we're going to discuss tonight is caught not taught, transformation versus information, and impartation. Our ceiling should be their floor. And um, so we're going to probably jump around. Um, our heart is, is we don't want to create a formula, and we don't prepare for 40 hours for a sermon. We live life, and out of that life, God gives us what we need to speak on. And so we've all been in different areas, and we're going to watch God bring it all together. Yeah. So that's what the cool part of this is, is. It's not about what one of us has. It's about how God brings the puzzles together. And you all have a piece of that puzzle today. Didn't do that, did you? <laughs> yes, so how many did their homework? How many of you out there did your homework? All right, sweet. All right, who didn't do the homework? All right, you can come up here. Um, what's your name? Um, Josh. Come on up here a second. See, that's what happens when you do it. It's called Offer Ministries for a reason. You hear a thump thump? You can, you can just stand right here. My dream is to be in union with Jesus for the rest of my life. But what more? Um, what do you put in your heart to do? To your vessel. <laughs> <laughs> I do my homework. Huh? I do my homework. Yeah, I want to equip, educate children in their destiny, in their, ed educate children in their identity. I can't look at you and then look at this awkward, right? I'm like, talking, right? Okay, I'll do it this way. I'm listening like the back voice. Uh, yeah, educate children in their identity, equip them in their uh, authority, and uh, ekbalo, ekbalo, send them into their destiny so that they are nation changers. They are bringing the kingdom of God, so... And it's a spiritual mother and father. So tangibly, what does that look like? Uh, elementary schools, supernatural elementary schools, starting in, I just talked, we got 75 rye land free, just tonight, I just heard about it. Last week, one of our, our interim director, who's taking my place, got kidnapped <laughs> to go to a meeting, basically, in a good way. And uh, met a Christian man who says, I have 75 rye of land, how, how much is that? That's about, it's, it's, it's how many acres? Wow. It's a lot. Anyway, it's a lot of acres. And uh, and uh, they want to build a Christian community, and the Christian community would be the school. So 
we might just have free land. We were gonna, we're trying to fundraise for a million dollars. Maybe we just got it for you last week by being in the right place at the right time and allowing God to kidnap us. Sharing the love of Jesus with other people so they can be as free as I am. Okay, so how are you going to do that? By uh, listening to his will in my life. And yeah, those are, those are, you've got a bunch of great platitudes, mm -hmm. which are <laughs> high-level attitudes and altitude. It's mm -hmm. great. But how are you going to actually, if I'm standing in front of you, how are you going to share the love of Jesus? Recently, it's been a one-on-one -on -one intimate con conversation. Okay. Getting to know them. Reaching yeah. daily lifestyle. Yeah. Okay. So, if I can say something, I feel I feel like um, you're you're kind of in the initial stages. Like you've got this passion inside of you for Jesus, which is awesome. Um, and sometimes we're in a place where we already know tangibly what we want to do. Uh, sometimes we don't. Um, but oftentimes, it comes from where your passions lie, whether it's music or sometimes it's your you just get riled up about injustice, and maybe in a particular area, and you wonder why no one is doing it. And it's generally because God's like, I'm prepared, you can do it. Yeah. Um, so I just want you to start meditating on that, start asking God, what is it? You know, maybe you don't even recognize it yet, and just start asking the Lord to reveal what that is. I like that. Yeah. Thank you. So one reason why it's important to start doing that is because a bike, a car, a ship, an airplane, none of those things can actually be directed until they're moving. So until you start moving towards what it is that God wants to bring forth through you, he may not give you the next piece. It's a good thing I'm here tonight. Yeah. Oh, man. And next week he's going to do his homework. <laughs> Thank you so much. Come on, Nate. So for for him being uh, fairly new in, in, in the faith, that's that's amazing. That's amazing that he's that deep, and that that says a lot for the, for the people that are around him. Yes. <laughs> yes. Amen. That's, that's amazing. So, um, but I, I just wanted to say um, that my dream and Amy's dream. Are similar. I, I would love to have a supernatural school where yes. we equip the saints and where people can come and get filled up and get everything that they need to live out a life where they're doing the will of the Lord, uh, to learn how to hear Him and to seek after Him and to, and to just rest in His presence and love Him. Um, that's that's the dream of my heart, and it looks like a supernatural school of ministry. But unlike any other supernatural school of ministry that's on the planet right now, um, I don't know 100% the details about it, but um, it's going to be a lot student-led. So um, they're going to empower each other and, and, and seek his face together and worship and, and pray. Yeah. Um, the reason why we really want to push people out of the comfort zone, and you know, sometimes you're not, you don't grow until someone pushes you. You know, and someone told me that they that I push people too much, and I said, well, they haven't died yet. <laughs> and you know, a palm tree doesn't grow until it's in a hurricane and it's pushed to its limits and it starts to grow because its roots go deeper and deeper. So we're like a palm tree by the ocean, and you know, or or you're in the ocean, whichever. So, um, but one of the things that I learned a couple years ago, um, you know, we study about the history of America, and Columbus is a huge uh, reason why we're here. You know, and I don't care what anybody says about him; he was an amazing man. 
and he 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 helped find he helped find America. And um, my heart is is one of the sayings that he has spoken, and it's known for him is a man without a vision will perish, and it's actually a scripture. And so, you know, I believe he was biblical. I believe he was he was godly man, you know. And I'm not here to debate what, what people believe in our historians because I know that was one of the, the monuments that was taken down in some of the states. So, you know, our history helps us become who we, we are becoming. And if we know where we came from, we know where we're going. And he was a frontier. He was a pioneer. And that's what we're called to be. And if we have no vision, you perish. Because then hopelessness and despair and discouragement gets in. You become complacent and you just lack a daisy. And the enemy comes in and you might not think he's hammering you. But the enemy will come in slowly. And then he'll just weasel his way around your leg. You know, and up your leg and around your body until you're in a cocoon and you can't move. And it's not a butterfly cocoon. But in the midst of having a vision, God is, he created us out of imagination. So he is imaginary. And, and, and he spoke us into being. You know, he, he created earth. And out of that imagination that lives inside of you, because we become one with him in John 17, it says that we are one with Jesus as he's one with the Father. So it's not just Jesus that lives inside of you. When you accepted Jesus, you didn't just accept Jesus. You accepted the entire enchilada. You know, you have God. You have the Holy Spirit. You have heaven. You have the angels at your, at your hands. And when you really know who you are, like... I believe that we all have a purpose. And so we don't always know what that is, especially when we're really new at this. But I believe that as you all continue to walk this out, you'll realize that, you know, with Denise, she's a hairstylist. And she's a good one too. yes, she is, and she's amazing, and she makes you feel beautiful, and so go check her out. It's Denise Crow in Little Rock, Arkansas. <laughs> <laughs> She is. She rocks. See? You know? <laughs> but anyway, so she takes the kingdom to work. And as she lays hands on people, she allows them to feel beautiful inside and out. So that's part of her purpose, but that's not all she's called to be. And I believe in, in these next five weeks, she's going to realize that there's even a greater call in her life than just being a hairstylist. I believe that God's going to take you into the, into the missions field and you're going to go all over the world. Yeah, come on. And, it, and it might need to be to train up other hairstylists in third world countries. I don't know. But there's more to your life. And so go beyond where you are today. And that's what we're believing that this homework, you've got to do your homework. you got to do your homework. When you do your homework and you start to really meditate on, okay, what is my... <clears throat> My purpose in life. What is the desire that God has put in my heart? And today, where am I at? And we co-air with him. A lot of people have the dreams up here on the shelf and they never do anything with them. And they wonder why. Well, God's waiting for you to like step into it. It's an action. We need to step. And if we never step into it, we're not going to move forward. And can he like plop you in the middle of somewhere? Yes, he can. But his heart is for you to co-heir with him. He has given you all power and authority to trample on snakes and scorpions. He has given you the ability to go do the commission. And he's commanded you to heal the sick, cast out demons, and all that other stuff. But he called you to go into all the world. Amen. Not to just sit on the throne in your house. <laughs> so... So um, one of the topics that we wanted to address is caught, not taught. And a lot of times when people discuss impartation and kind of catching the fire of God so that you can run into what it is that you're actually being asked to bring forth as you co-labor with the Lord, um, 
they tend to um, find the scriptures that talk about impartation directly. And but um, I thought, you know, we've probably heard a lot of those already. And so when I sat with the Lord, he showed me a completely different way of looking at it. And so I thought that um, I would share that. Um, and so do you want to do caught first or taught first? Let's do taught. Does that sound good? Sure. Okay. All right. So taught, because actually when I first wrote it down, I wrote it down backwards and I wrote down taught, not caught. And I was like, oh, wait, that's not what I meant. Um, yeah. <clears throat> So, for taught, the big teachers back in the day when Jesus was out and about were the Pharisees. And in a nutshell, the problem that I believe Jesus had with the Pharisees was that they were, once again, seeking the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Okay, so there's two trees in the garden tree of life, that's Jesus, and then there's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And they were choosing to eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and they were continuously seeking knowledge for knowledge's sake. But the particular bone that Jesus had to pick with them, in my estimation, is that they were supposed to be helping people come to know him, and they weren't. Instead, what they were doing is they were making up all sorts of additional rules to make sure that really nobody could gain the kingdom. And Jesus specifically addressed that in <clears throat> Matthew, and I'll tell you the scripture at the end because I, I, I don't want to take too long to hit this stuff. But he basically, he says, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites. For you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. You neither go in yourselves, nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Now he said that twice. And he said, you devour widows' houses for pretense making long prayers. Therefore, you will receive greater condemnation. And he continues on to call them blind guides. And I believe that that actually goes hand in hand with Isaiah. All right, so that was Matthew 23, 13. Then it, that goes hand in hand with Isaiah chapter six, where he is talking, he's talking and he says, um, make the heart of this people dull and their ears heavy and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and return and be healed. And I was like, wow, that's really hardcore. You know, I mean, he doesn't want them to be healed. It's like, that is just wrong. Sorry, God. But I felt that that was harsh. Um, but I feel like God specifically says that if you are a teacher, there's a higher standard applied to you. And woe to the one who leads one of these little ones astray. Better to tie a millstone around your neck and jump in to the deep end than to continue forward holding these children back from the kingdom. Um, you know. So it's something to keep in mind, you know, um, when we've been entrusted by the Lord to teach people things, we, we want to be about our Father's business and we want to co-labor with Him and we want to teach them how to actually enter into the kingdom instead of just give them highfalutin sound bites which aren't going to really get them anywhere, you know. Um, so the... Uh, next thing, we'll, we'll move on to the better side of the house. Caught. Right? So this is this is where people actually catch it. And so the difference between caught and not taught in my mind is something that's taught lands here. And it just stays there. It's head knowledge. Great in theory, but are you putting it into practice? 
And the only way that we can really enter into putting things truly into practice, or the way, only way we're able to become passionate about it, is if it makes the longest journey in the world, which is from your mind to your heart. That's like the longest distance traveled, you know? So um, when you've caught it, you get it, and you get it in your heart, and that's the point at which information becomes revelation. And once it's your revelation, then it can lead to transformation. And that's, I believe, the Lord's goal, or one of them. Amen. Um, so on the caught side of the house, God showed me all this great stuff where Jesus was actively doing impartation, only it's not pointed out that way. So a great example, the woman at the well, okay? So he encounters a woman who's supposed to be one of his enemies because she's a Samaritan and not supposed to deal with a woman either, you know? He's a rabbi. But he asks her for water and they have this exchange and he proceeds to tell her that basically I know everything about you but I'm not really passing judgment on you. I'm just letting you know that there's hope for you. And he introduces her to hope, which is himself. And he lets her know that actually, yeah, I'm the one who you've heard of. And she's so impassioned by it that she runs back to the town where she has no friends. And she runs up to them and she's giddy about it. And she's like, told me everything about my life and they're probably all thinking well, that's not a good day you know I mean really because they knew what she was doing right right I mean he pulled her covers so to speak and she's so impassioned you gotta come meet this guy and they all catch it and they all go and then Jesus hangs out for a few days longer much to the dismay of his Disciples, because they come back, they're like, what's going on here, you know? We'll leave you unsupervised for two minutes, you know? I mean, they're like, what are you doing, right? And, and they come back, and they're thinking, well, he ought to be hungry by now. And Jesus replies, I have meat you know not of. You know? Because cause Jesus has moved on from the milk. He's not being spoon-fed by anybody at this point. He's got a direct line to the Father, and he's only doing what he hears the Father say. He's only saying that, and he's only doing what he sees the Father do. And that is the meat of the kingdom. So he's being fed. His spirit is advancing and maturing. So the next one that the Lord showed me, ooh, that was loud, was <laughs> the woman with the issue of blood. Okay, so she knows she is not supposed to be out in society, right? But she also knows she's got a big problem. And she knows that she's done everything she could. She no longer has any money to devote to this issue. She needs help. And she has faith in Jesus. So she makes her way through the crowd, and she's thinking, if I can just touch the hem of his garment, I'm going to be healed. And she touches him, and he imparts to her. And he knows he's in part, and he's like, whoa, who touched me? And the disciples are like, well, how are we going to tell you that? There's like way too many people around here. We don't know. And the woman realizes, you know, hey, he's on me. Because I think she knows who he is straight up. So she says, you know what? You got me. I touched you. And Jesus, instead of becoming unclean, He's fine. He continues forth. Nobody calls him on it. Yeah. You know? He just imparted healing to her. So I thought that was pretty cool. And the final episode that he drew my attention to, and there's many, many more, and you're, you know, should you feel the call, it's fun to check them out. Um, but the next one was there's a man with blindness, and that one's in Mark chapter 8. And he's got blindness. He knows that Jesus is, is his answer. And so he's like, yeah, I gotta get help, you know? So he gets Jesus, he gets his attention. Jesus takes him away from the crowd. Because sometimes you gotta move away from the doubters. Sometimes you have to, you know, step into a private moment with the Lord. Takes him over to the side, spits 
in his eye. Right? And he says, so, how's that working for you? And the guy says, I see men like trees. Okay? So Jesus is like, this is great, it's working. Right? And he, he, he prays for him again, and the guy sees things clearly. Now, here's my personal spin on this, and this is not necessarily your revelation yet, but this is just the way the Lord showed it to me. Jesus spits in his eye. The guy, I, I don't believe Jesus had to pray for him twice. Okay, I'm just going to go on the record saying that. He didn't have to pray for him twice. I believe that the very first time Jesus addressed his spiritual condition, and he opened his eyes spiritually, and he says, I see men like trees. And that was because he saw the disciples, and the disciples were in the process of becoming oak trees planted by living water. Okay? That's just my take on it. Then he prays again, and the guy has his natural sight open too. But Jesus imparted healing to him, and he imparted spiritual healing to him. He opened his spiritual eyes, so that's caught, not taught. And that was just kind of the fun stuff that the Lord showed me. Jump in the river. Oh, I'm going to jump in. Um, hey, see? I'm, I'm going to look. I'm going to look at the double portion because I want more. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, um, in in Kings, Second Kings two five through fourteen, and you can read it. You can read it all a little bit later. We don't have a whole lot of time. We don't have a whole lot of time. So I'm just going to read up. I'm just going to cherry pick it a little bit. Um, and Elijah said to Elisha, Ask what I shall do for you before I am taken from you. And Elijah said, Please let a double portion of your spirit be upon me. And he said, You have asked for a hard thing. Nevertheless, if you see me when I am taken from you, it shall be so for you, but if not, it shall not be so. And you all know the rest of the story. He kept his eyes on him. He focused on him. He watched him. And he didn't even, he didn't leave him alone for a second. Didn't let him go behind a tree and use the restroom. He was there. And the chariot came down and swept him up in a whirlwind to heaven. And he was gone. He was taken away. And his mantle fell off and landed on the ground. And Elisha went over and picked it up. And he received the double portion of the anointing. And we can we can walk this thing out with a with a single portion of the anointing, but I think it's better to walk it out with a double. And I want a double. I mean if there's such a thing as a quadruple or take it. Like, whatever whatever God has for me, I'll take it. Jesus is full measure. Yeah. So, what does that look like? What does it look like for me? The first thing that I have to do is count the cost. What's it going to cost me? And when, you know, when a man builds a house, he doesn't just go start buying stuff. He counts the cost. He figures out what it's going to cost him. He knows the cost, and I, I, I count the cost. Sometimes it might cause stress in my family. Sometimes it might cause um, yeah, it's the same lightly. Um, <laughs> sometimes sometimes going after that is going to be hard and sometimes it's going to hurt. Sometimes it might rip you apart. But it's worth it. <laughs> it's worth it. Because he's worth it. Um, and you know like I can't give, like, Elijah, Elijah was looking at her. He was trying to give and impart something twice of what he had. You don't go up to somebody and say, I need 80 bucks, and you know for a fact that they only have 40. That doesn't work. But in the kingdom, it works. Yeah. Because God, because God said, because God said this 
place of obedience, this very spot of obedience that you're in, is where I'm going to give that double portion to you. And if we obey the voice of the Lord, if we step into destiny because of obedience, God is a generous multiplier. He doesn't give us bad things when we ask for good things. He, he's a really good father. He's an excellent father. You know, I don't, you know, we, we have not because we ask not. And I don't want to have not because I ask not. I want my heart to be in the right position to receive everything that he has for me. I want to pray for the sick and heal them like John Lake. I want to be bold like Smith Wigglesworth. I want to prophesy like Daniel. I want to heal the sick like Peter. I want to walk like Jesus. John G. Lake had sickness in his body when he was younger. And he encountered a man named John Dowie at a meeting. And he was radically transformed. His healing ministry was birth. I'm not saying that it was easy. It never will be. It never is. But his healing ministry was started in a healing room. It was called Human Home in Chicago. And because of John G. Lace, here's just a little snippet of his what he's what he did. Um, Dr. John Lake's ministry led to the medically confirmed healings of more than a hundred thousand people. Medically confirmed healings of 100,000 people. Through prayer in the name of Jesus, his life was a powerful example of faith in action. John Lake believed that every Christian ought to live such a life, experiencing the fullness of Christ. He never ceased to exhort others and exhort others to attain this fullness. He never ceased to exhort others to attain this fullness. which God is ready and willing to bestow. I so, I was actually going to say something about John G. Lake, too. Oh, sorry. I was going to say something about John G. Lake, too. Um, today I was reading in this little book we have for the kids. It's, it's about John G. Lake. And, um, anyway, it was just, I was reading the part where it was telling about how um, he had, like 15, I think it was 15 siblings, there was a whole bunch of them. Anyway, like, as a child, he kept, like, they, they all kept dying. Like, his, his siblings just kept passing away. So, you know, it was just, it's just what he expected. You know, when somebody got sick, he expected the hearse to come and then go to the graveyard and bury one of his siblings. And um, so, as he got older, um, he got saved. And he, after he got saved, he, he wrote... He had this newspaper that he created in, um, in this little town. And anyway, his legs started aching, and then they became crippled, and the doctor told him he had rheumatism, which is like arthritis. Anyway, he was hurting so bad, um, he heard of this healing room from John Dowie, and he went there, and um, he had to, like, practically drag himself in there because he was in so much pain he couldn't walk. And when he went in there, somebody came up and laid hands on him, prayed for him, his legs straightened out, and he was healed. So he went home, and he had a brother who had been sick for 22 years. He told his brother about it, got his brother, brought his brother to the healing house. People laid hands on his brother, his brother was healed. So they go back, and he had a sister that had breast cancer and was expected to die at any time. So he gets her, takes her to the healing house, and he leaves her there for a couple of days, and she was hearing the word preached, and while she was laying there, she started believing that what God says is true, and believing what the Bible says, all of a sudden, she was healed, and so, you know, and then he had, like, after that, he had a, another sister that was on her deathbed, and his mother gives him a call and says, you need to come, and, because um, your sister is dying, and he gets there, and as he's there with her, like, she passes away, he he feels her and she has no pulse. And he sends a message. He just couldn't let her go in his spirit. He was just like, I, I know what that God can heal. And I just can't believe that she's gone. 
um, he sends a message to uh, John Dowie um, and asking him to pray for her. Because um, at that point, he was like, well, I can't do that because I'm nobody, you know? So he asks, he sends a message to John Dowie asking him to pray. And John Dowie sends a message back after a little time has passed and says, I will pray. Um, I believe she's going to live. And faith rose up within him. And he went into the, to the room where his sister's dead body was, prayed over her for an hour. His <laughs> sister sat up. And a couple days later, it was Christmas Day, and she was, she was having Christmas with her family. So, which is crazy. Like, but all of that came because he went, because he was seeking healing and just seeking the Lord for what the Lord could, could give him. Not necessarily, he wasn't thinking impartation, but he just wanted whatever it was the Lord, because he's like, I know what your word says, so that's what I'm going to believe you for. I need healing in my body. But, because, but from that moment, he started seeing God heal. And then the faith started rising up in him. The more he saw God move, the more he felt God move. And not only in his own body, but saw it in his siblings. Like, all of a sudden, he was able to pray over his sister and see the power of God raise her back from the dead. And I think, you know, like, as we, um, you know, when we need prayer for something, every time we go up to somebody, the Lord is imparting into us. You know? It doesn't matter... Um, if it's me or if it's Chris or if it's Lee or Bill or whoever, you know, the Holy Spirit is moving and he's imparting into us. Mm -hmm. So, you know, he's, he's raising our faith so that we can continue to walk out. And so we can go out and raise the dead, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, I want to see the dead raised. Come on. I want to I be able to go out and just start singing and see, see demons leave people. Mm -hmm. I want to see people set free. That's my heart. Like, mm -hmm. I want to see people... Like, just I just want to strum on the guitar. Lee is starting to teach me. Thank you, Lee. Um, but anyway, I just want to get able to strum on the guitar and like just pour my heart out to the Lord, and people get set free. You know, and that's what I want to see. And I just believe that's going to happen. You know, one day. I don't know how, when, where. You know, I don't know if I'm going to be in Africa one day playing my guitar, which is crazy to even say that because a year ago I was like, I'm never going back to Africa. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, just like a couple of months ago I was saying that. So Bill Smith had something to do with that. He prayed a prayer and like, I don't know what, what little juju you did on me, Bill. <laughs> So with teaching, you know, you raise a child in the way they should go. And when they're older, they'll go in it, right? That's what scripture says. Now, that's how teaching is. We, like people will teach us and they tell us scriptures and we say, okay, yeah, we get it. But all of a sudden, we are kicked out of the boat. And it, you know, it's sink or swim. Like, have we caught it? And that's the place like Israel was in. And they're in the desert. And they send out 12 spies. Mm -hmm. 10 of them didn't catch it, but two of them did. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. Two of them said, No, we've seen what the Lord can do and will do. They caught it. I don't know how long it took, but they caught it and said, No, that's mine. That land belongs to me. I don't care how big that guy is. It's mine. All right? The centurion, he caught it. All right? He had a servant was sick. And he was a man under authority. And he said, well, if I tell my guys to go, they just go and they do whatever I told them to do. Jesus 
if you say that this thing has to go, for my servant, it has to go. He died. He, it came from a place that he understood. And for you guys, it may come from a place where you understood. For me, the Lord has taught me, I'm an electrician. I went through an apprenticeship. Now, the Lord's been very specific with me. Discipleship looks like apprenticeship. I'm like, oh, okay, that works. Well, apprenticeship, for five years, I worked with journeyman electricians, and they taught me how to do my trade. My real apprenticeship didn't start until I graduated my apprenticeship and I was kicked out. All right, now you're on your own. Did I catch it? Some of it I didn't catch. Some of it, some of it I was going to learn how to catch, and I'm still learning how to catch, you know? Um, but then there comes that moment where it becomes mine. All right? And so Chris is talking about this double portion, which is so good. Because Elisha realizes, he asks, he requests of Elijah to have a double portion of his anointing. Which is very interesting, because it, Elijah's response is, that's a really difficult thing to ask. Mm. But, you know, if you see me go up, then, then you've got it. Mm. But you know what's really interesting? So, Jesus' disciples... When they're following Jesus, Jesus resurrects and then he ascends, right? He ascends on the Holy Spirit afterwards. He can't give him a double portion because he's the fullness of it, right? But the very thing that Elisha asked from Elijah, Jesus gives to the disciples. Now we know in scripture that Malachi says that Elijah is coming back, right? All right, so he's the father. He's returning the hearts of the fathers to the sons and the sons to the fathers. What God wants to do is raise up fathers who are going to impart to their children. And then the father's ceiling becomes the children's floor. Right? We might not have it all. Jesus has it all. But that's what we're called to do. There's that double portion or the fullness that Jesus is asking of us. You see it in John G. Lake. You see it in Smith Wigglesworth. You see it in William Bram. He's another one who was really sick. And he's like, no, this is mine. These are men that have transformed Christianity as we know it in modern times. And it's for us, if we want it, if you caught it. So, um, I love, I feel like this is a segue that's kind of bringing everything together. Um, I didn't really think about this until today. And I'm, I was praying and asking God to like highlight some things that I didn't know before. Because I always want to learn. And if I'm not always learning from Him, then what do I have? I become stagnant, you know. And I don't want to ever become stagnant. I don't want to ever think that I know it all. I don't want to think that I've arrived because, you know... If I'm not standing before God, I haven't arrived, and I should be teachable. And if you become to the point that you can't be teachable, you might want to go sit down for a little bit and go talk to the Father, because He has a lot of things to say to you. Um, so this was really cool. It's in Matthew 4, 19. And, and it's Jesus talking to disciples, and He says, Come follow me. And Jesus said, I will make you fishers of men. He caught them. And then he taught them so that they could go catch others and teach them. <laughs> I'm like, wow, that's like really cool. So you kind of need, need both because Jesus walked beside the disciples for three and a half years. And they didn't get it. Like they did not catch it right away. You know, he would talk to them and ask them different questions. And they were like, <laughs> you know, I think only one time they actually got it. So, um, what that makes me think of is that Jesus, serving as a spiritual father to the disciples, knew that there was going to come a time when they were going to be kicked out of the nest or out of the boat, and they were going to have to be able to think on their own. So that's, I believe, one of the reasons why he spoke to them in parables. But there were other times when he was really straightforward with them. And one of his greatest promises was that, um, that for those who were following him, even greater things 
they would do. So that's the promise of a father, a spiritual father, who has lifted them up, brought them up to his level, acquainted them with how to think on that level, which is, you know, kind of um, an allegorical level. It's not, not straight stories, but it was parables. And he was doing it because that, he was speaking their language to them in a way that was creative. Because the kingdom isn't the way our world is. You know, the Lord warns us. He's like, your thoughts aren't my thoughts yet. You know, as high as the, the sky is above the earth, you know, big difference, you know. Um, but, but a father wants their current position spiritually to be the launching point for their children. And, and if somebody has gone through an apprenticeship and they have learned things, or if somebody is at the point of teaching new people in an apprenticeship, you teach them the tricks of the trade. You teach them the things that work. You know, um, why reinvent the wheel? You know, all those concepts hold true. You know, nobody wants, I, I don't want people to have to go through the difficult learning curve that I went through. Because in some instances, I didn't count the cost. You know, and, and people don't understand. Because as people, we look at all these people out here and we're like, oh, well, that one has like a ministry that I, I should have that. And it's like, no. Can you drink the cup? Do you have any idea what was invested in my learning curve? Probably not. Because if we're walking this out in a kingdom way, we're not sniveling about what the cost is. Instead, we're choosing to focus on Jesus and we're celebrating the place that he's leading us into. Because if you're a Christian, you are not a victim. Those two things don't work. They're contrary. And it's, you know, you can't have two kings in one kingdom. You know? And... And, you know, sniveling and complaining, that's basically devil worship. You know, people may not want to hear that, but that really is what it is. You know, who are you giving airtime to? You know, so, so I choose to thank God, you know, for bringing me through the difficult places and granting me a greater level of the spiritual authority when I get to the other side. You know, and, and as spiritual mothers and fathers... We should be doing our best to share with others some of the things that we've learned along the way. I feel like, you know, I'm a father first. I feel like I'm a father first. No, no matter what, no matter what is happening in my life, I feel like I need to be a father. Amen. And that's that's the kingdom of God. That's the basis of the kingdom of God. He is our father, first and foremost. And Amy is a mother. You know, whether Trina is a mother, whether she has natural children or not, Edie is a mother. Jacob is a father. Everybody in this room can be mothers and fathers. We all can be. And like, you know, I think that the I think that the term apostle has been misused. I think it's a little bit, it's a little bit blown out of proportion. I think that we've missed some of the point of what an apostle is. It's someone who's sent to transform and influence and to make this look like where they came from. And we're all citizens of heaven. So we need to make this look like the kingdom of heaven. Area to little, make Little Rock look like the kingdom of heaven. And I'm saying that just to go here, where we need to be, we need to be ever mindful of our influence. We need to be ever mindful of our spirit of influence. And I'm going to tell you today, I've, I've not been very mindful of my spiritual influence. And I've missed some things. But tomorrow's a new day. Amen. Amen. And we're not perfect. We're humans. We love.
love Jesus, and we carry a mighty calling. We carry an authority that, you know, I don't even sometimes understand why he gave it to us, but he knows better than me. But we miss it. We fall short. But when we when we look at him and we share, like we look, when we look at him and we see who he is, we see who we are. And like that transforms us into who he's calling us to be. But I think that the most important thing is, is that God is calling the mothers and the fathers in the body of Christ. He's calling them to move into their place, into where they belong. And you're, you're not going to see church as normal. It's not going to. It's not going to be normal. Never again. Never. No. Um, so God put two uh, revival leaders on my heart. And um, one is the father of the second great awakening, Charles Finney. So we're talking about fathers. And um, did you know that he was a lawyer? And he didn't know God? And as he studied, he realized that, like, man, this is like, there's biblical truth. And he didn't know that that's what it was. And someone, he was asking someone about, um, like, who, where is all this, these thoughts come from? And the guy that he was talking to said, what he realized that the American law is actually based on scripture, and it's based on the Bible, it's based on God. And I, I'm like, hmm. I mean, I knew that our constitution was, but wow, you know, our law is too. And it's all founded in God. Like, so I just thought that was amazing. And so as he, he's becoming a lawyer, God is drawing him in. And, and I think it was within a year of him studying law that he wanted, he says, well, give me one of the Bibles because I want to know where this is all coming from. <laughs> so, you know, curiosity, like, draws people in. And so he was being taught, and God was about ready to, or, yeah, and God was about ready to catch him. And so the cool thing is, he was going after God with all his heart. And he's like, God, I need to know who you are. And he went out in the woods one day, and he's like, I'm not going to leave here until you show up. And God didn't show up, not in the way that he thought. And he went back to his law office, and do you know that God showed up in his law office? And you know that impartation that you all kind of probably, most of you have experienced, where you get electrified? You know, and you felt the presence of God like he wanted to kill you. And it's not a scary thing because if you don't get an understanding of who God is inside of you, and not everyone gets that. Someone, some people feel the power of love. Some feel the power of peace. You know, it's, it's how God wants to speak to you, and it's not about being afraid. The manifestations are from God. You know, and so... He gets so radically touched. I love this. This is so cool. So he gets so radically touched that the next day he goes and he has a client. So this is cool. So he's he's defending a client. And he, he goes into the office, and this is his quote. He says, I have a retainer from the Lord Jesus Christ to plead his case. And, and he told the man, I cannot plead yours. And he ran for God, and he and he went and walked it all out, and he became the father of the second great awakening. I'm not saying you walk away from your job, because you need to know what God is saying for you, because he might be using you in that job. He might have used Charles Finney in that lawyer position to set a lot of people free. You know, and you never know how God's going to use you. And Josh, I just want to encourage you. You're in a really great position with God because, yes, we need to have that position with God so that we can do the stuff with Him. Because if we try to do the stuff without Him, we're going to be dried up and we're going to become hypocrites. We're going to become theologians without any spirit life. And that's not a good place because we're doing everything for God and not with God. And there's no spirit to breathe on the other people. And so a lot of the seeds that are planted go by the wayside because there's no spirit or life in it. You know, I'm not saying that you can't do that, but, I mean, that's a hard ground to plow. And so by you being filled with the spirit, are you, um, 
massage therapist or something like that. So how cool is this? Two years from now, you have your own business. And I don't know you, I don't know what your dream is. Just hypothetically, you have your own business and you have people all around you that are spirit-filled people and you cultivate an atmosphere in your office. And when people walk in and they lay on that table to give a massage, they encounter Jesus while they're out in the spirit while you're giving them a massage. So they walk away with healing within them because they encountered Jesus. They didn't encounter Josh. They encountered Jesus and he rewired their brain. You know, they gave, God gave them an encounter, an impartation. You never know what it might be. God knows what those people need. And so as you bring the spirit of God down and through you, you change the atmosphere everywhere you go. And as you go and seek God like Charles Finney did, you don't know what amazing things God might do. And so this other guy, and, and by the way, his transformation looked like this. A hundred thousand were added to the church by one person, a lawyer. He wasn't seeking God, he was seeking law. He was studying law, he was going to be a lawyer. He was a lawyer. The other one was Evans Roberts, Evan Roberts, and um, his prayer was God bend me, and I encourage you as we go into prayer here later, cry out to God, and you give up to God what you want him to do with you, you know, I know we all talk about what is the cost, and to me, the, the cost is for me to stand before God and say, you know what, I counted the cost and I chose not you. I chose my family, I chose my job, I chose, you know, my wife or whatever. You know, I love what Heidi and Roland Baker said the other day, I listened to them, and Roland Baker is doing an interview of how him and Heidi Baker met. And this is what I loved about his positional heart with God he said, I knew that I can never compete for Heidi's love like God did. And I knew that I could never be the husband that he was to her. And he said, I'm okay with that. And that, when we are one with the Father, our spouses will be okay with that, and you will become one together, and you will catapult each other into your destinies. And if you don't have that, you go search it out. You go find a, a weekend retreat away from everyone and anyone by yourself first and then go with your spouse. And you go find the God that you need in your life because that's what's wrong with our world is we put God at the bottom of our list. We put our families first. We put our ministries first. And that's where we become complacent. We created traditions. And do you know what? Charles Finney, he went and researched the First Great Awakening and he wanted to know why a lot of those people fell away from God. They were backsliders. And he said it was because they become complacent, become comfortable, and they started traditions. And they didn't go after the heart of God continually. We need to continually stay filled. And if we don't stay continually filled, we might as well go sit down somewhere because we're not pouring out God in other people. We're pouring out ourselves, and that's not a good thing. And I'm going to end my little rant <laughs> when um, when we have an encounter with God, we need to have a transformation in our life. The transformation in those two men was eternal salvation for multitudes. They ran with what God gave them in the direction God called them to. Just like Paul. Paul was a theologian. He was taught. He had all this head knowledge, but yet he didn't have the spirit of God. He thought he was doing the right thing. He thought he was following God. He was killing Christians. He was martyring even Stephen. And they laid all his, their clothes at his feet. 
when they were martyr, martyring Stephen, when they were stoning him, in that moment, Stephen stands, or um, this, I believe it was Jesus that, that rises up inside of Stephen and he says, they know not what they do. Same words Jesus spoke on the cross. I believe that that spirit of God hunted Paul down. And, and I believe that Paul had passion and God could work with. And I always said that when I, when I went to Brazil, I saw passion. I never saw passion in America. Like, I'm serious. We are dead. We look like Ewers. We call ourselves Christians, but how many of us are really on fire for God? Right here. Amen. And when I went to Brazil, I saw it didn't matter if they were running in the wrong direction for God. God could grab a hold of them in a heartbeat. And they were transformed. And Paul was running in the wrong direction 100 mile an hour. God knocks him off his high horse, blinds him, and then has somebody being obedient who's scared to death of Paul. And he goes and he prays for Paul, and Paul is revived. His his eyes were he could see again. And this time he was filled with the Holy Spirit. He got his life turned around a 180, and he ran unto death unto the Lord. <laughs> so there were um, three um, victory lap scriptures that occurred to me, and. Um, one of them is actually the parable of the man who plants a good crop and it's as if an enemy came during the night and sowed some tares in with that crop. It says that the, the man who planted the crop is not going to risk the development of the good crop by pulling out the tares. He's going to wait until it's time to harvest it. Well, what that parable speaks to me is that we are not of the world, but we're still in the world. And God has started to cultivate and plant a good crop in our hearts. And unfortunately, because we are still in the world, the enemy has opportunities to sow tares in our hearts. Okay? And we have to guard our eyes. We need to guard our ears. We need to guard our mouths. And, and the way that we guard our mouths is by being very careful what we say. We don't want to come into an agreement with something that is not of the Lord. Um, I believe that that's one reason why that parable is in there. Okay? And I know that we all want to have a good crop in our hearts. Um, and, I, and I know that God has planted amazing things in our hearts, whether they're dreams that he wants to bring forth or whether it's the fruits of the spirit or whether it's just divine appointments, all sorts of great things, okay? So that, that was one of the three that occurred to me. Um, darn, there are two others. They're very shiny. She's going to circle back. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but <clears throat> I just, I just really, we all, we all have plans, right? We, we, we have plans. We have plans. But, but God says for, I have plans that um, are going to prosper you and give you hope and peace. So my plans, Amy and I have plans. And we were going to just kind of be a cute couple that hung out and raised children and played and went on vacations and and then went to there is more conference <laughs> and and, and God, <laughs> God rocked us <laughs> he rocked us he rocked our world and we'll, we'll do anything we'll go anywhere we don't care God wherever you are we'll go We'll go to Africa, we'll go to Mozambique, we'll go to, we'll go to Thailand, we'll go to, we'll go anywhere. We don't care. God, wherever you are, that's where I want to be. Wherever your heart for me is, that's where I want to be. I don't want to just have a nice life here. 
I don't want to just, I don't want to just be a welder and a fabricator and be a really good one. I just, I want to do what you have. Some, some people might be like, I don't know where to go. I don't know what to do. But God has plans. Just seek his face. Go around people, like for the people that are watching online, just hang around with people who, who get it. Hang around with people who love Jesus. Go to revivals, go to meetings. Um, you know, it's, we, need, we don't need any more teaching. We don't need any more preaching. We need the revelation that comes from a heart to connect with the Father. We, we just, in everything that I do, in everything that I say, I want people's hearts to get closer to God with every word. So, ask God what His plans are for you, not what your plans are for you. Amen. So we, we've got a lot of work to do. <laughs> We're the bride of Christ, and He's getting us ready. And we've got a lot of work to do. Amen. So if we all come together, and we behold his face and we run after him, it'll get done a lot quicker. I remember my two quick points. <laughs> it took me a little bit. Um, so the, the reason why I thought of the parable of the field and the crop is that um, I had earlier mentioned counting the cost and people, you know, they, they don't see what the cost has been. They just see where someone is as far as what their, quote, ministry looks like or what their spiritual life looks like. Well, God, you know, he says there's going to be people who on the final day, oh, we did all these things for you, and God's like, mm, I never knew you. Okay? So that's, that's a cost. We need to take the time to be intentional and spend time with the Lord and get to know him and get to know what he is trying to bring forth through our lives. You know, a couple of really great questions are, Lord, what does this mean and what must I do? Then the other scripture that really comes into play is the Lord warns us. He says, you know, you can be hot, you can be cold. I don't have a problem with that. But if you're lukewarm, you're not making the grade. You know? So we can't afford to just try to add God to our lives as usual. We need to get to know him. We need to find out what he wants us to be willing to give up. We need to understand how he wants us to guard our eyes and our ears. We need to understand what he's asking of us, you know? And one of the things that he asked of me for quite a few years before I actually was obedient, and by the way, delayed obedience is actually rebellion, but anyway, um, what he asked me to do was to quit watching TV. So I don't watch TV the way I used to. Every once in a while, I'll watch something, but I'm very careful as to what I watch, because even if there's just one drop of poison, over time, it'll kill you. And I don't understand why, as people, we would be okay with watching something on a TV show where if I was standing in someone's living room, I know for sure I wouldn't watch them being intimate with each other or kissing each other. I wouldn't watch that. That's like creepy. So why is it okay to watch it on TV? You know, and, and we write these things off by saying, well, it's just on TV. Well, no. No, those are your eye gates. Those are your ears. You know, and, and, and there's a higher standard to which we're called. And, and that's part of counting the cost, but oh my gosh, is it worth it? You know, the benefits, just being able to look in the eyes of Jesus, you will find every single thing you need in his eyes. You know? And then, 
Then he's so good, he's like, so what more would you like? You know? So, so when we take the time to cultivate an intimacy with him, basically the sky's the limit. Right. So if we can have Matt come up and do some worship for us, we're going to transition into We're going to transition into impartation, and I know a lot of you were at Bethel uh, Little Rock Church on Saturday, and you got impartation, and, and I believe in that you saw God do something that transformed your life during that night, and I want to share because I love this church, and I love what you guys are doing, and when I was down on the floor during the impartation, I'm, I'm willing to receive. I want to receive from everybody. I don't care who it is. You know, uh, short of, you know, someone being demonically possessed, you know, I'm not going to do that. But um, I believe that in any moment, God has something for us. And if we're not willing to go forward, I'm going to run. Like, I'm hungry. Because I know I haven't arrived yet. And so while I was laying on the floor, I heard God say, Go to Brazil in May. I'm putting this on record because I believe it was God and I got confirmation, I believe, today. And so yesterday I was seeking God and what does that look like? And, and I'm looking at our calendar as Edie and I are traveling over the next couple of weeks and a couple months. And, and I see May 5th float across my, my, my vision and I'm like, Oh, okay. And it's about the time we're in Virginia. Edie is going to voice of the prophets and get ordained at the Global Awakening Conference. And, um, you know, and it's right after that. And so it's prime time. It's, you know, you fill it up again and you take it to the nations. And I'm excited because I had a dream. And this is why I want you all to go seek God. If you don't have a heart dream, doesn't mean a dream in your nighttime. If you don't have a vision, if you don't have an understanding of where God is taking you, you go seek him because we can journal all we want. I do a lot of journaling, but if it doesn't lead me somewhere, I can talk to him all I want, but if it doesn't lead me somewhere, what do I have? Yeah, everyone can say, well, I, I'm called to be an intercessor. You know what? You find that in scripture and you bring it back to me that you're called to just be an intercessor because we're all called to continually pray. But Jesus gave us a commandment and he said to take it to all the world. Whatever that looks like that's different in each one and that's where we need this positioning with God. And he showed me in 2012 a corral full of stallions that were rearing up. They were ready to go but the gate was locked. And God said, if someone doesn't open the gate, they're going to get hurt. The next year, I'm in Brazil again. And he shows me that same vision. I'm in the same town. And I see my hand on that gate, and I jerk back. And I'm like, who am I? I'm not, I don't have the worth to touch that gate. Why not? Charles Finney did. God used him. William Branham. Randy Clark. Bill Johnson. You know, you go back and you look at all the revivals, and I'm not saying where God is taking me or what God's doing, but if I never step, I will never know. What is the greatest thing that can happen to me? I can succeed with the Father. It's the worst thing. You know, I get a little pride knocked off my shoulder. God can pick us up out of the dust. He can pick us up when man throws us down or when we trip. It's what we do with those mistakes that we think we made that aren't mistakes. Because failure is only when you quit. And so when you quit running, that's when you're in a really bad place. And that's where you have an opportunity to become a hypocrite. And I challenge you to go after the Bible and you go research that word and you see what God does with hypocrites. 
because there's another scripture other than what he talked, and I think it's in Matthew 24. And it's not a good place. But God gave me those visions, and I know two of the young girls that were their stallions, and one we got a chance to help a couple years ago, and it was radical, it was amazing. And I had to step away from a ministry school, leadership school. I had to choose to go get staying in school for seven more weeks or go and be obedient to God. And he called me out of that school, and it was not fun. But I chose to listen to God, and God put me in a position with Edie to go help a friend who flew in from Brazil for the first time in her life, and all her plans fell through. And she was left in Los Angeles with no money, no place to stay, and she was going to go get a job. And I said, how are you going to get a job? It would be illegal for you to work, so you're opening a door to the enemy. And we took her on a seven-week trip across America. And the day that I was graduating, and that would have graduated from a leadership school, a prominent leadership school, she was, it was her first day of attending Global School um, Summer Intensive Program. It was the day that she met her future husband. And they're expecting their second child. And she's running, their whole family is running full throttle for God. And they're working for a ministry out of Harrisburg. And it's just amazing the fruit that is in their lives. But if I would have chose to stay in that ministry school because the leadership thought that they knew better for me than I knew for myself, that's a bad place. Instead of blessing me, saying, hey, I, I believe you're hearing from God. Go for it. What's the worst thing? I would have had to go back to school the next year because I missed it. You know? But if I wouldn't have, I believe that something bad would have happened to our friend. And I don't know if I could have ever lived with my, myself. And I gave up a mission trip to the Philippines that year. That week, I had everything paid for. And I was to be in the Philippines when she flew in. And if I would have been in the Philippines for two weeks, I wouldn't have been able to help her. So sacrifice is a lot. And that's where we need to know what God is saying in our life. And so as you guys come forward, just line up over here. And just go after God for a few minutes and pray. And ask God to bend you. Ask God to allow you to be the quarter in his pocket and let him spend you however you want. And I challenge every one of you, this is a time to put away paper. This is a time to not be journaling. This is a time to not be praying. This is just a time that between you and him, to seek him. Let God bend me. Make me who you want me to be. And I'm believing that you will see another transformation. It doesn't take just one encounter. It takes multiple encounters. And are you hungry? And I believe this group is hungry. And as we walk this out, watch God transform you. And we will send you your homework assignment later. But we want you to do it next week. Because if you're not going to do homework, you know, it's less likely to be able to gain something from this group. And that's what we want you to do. We, we pray that we poke you and we provoke you to go after God deeper. So if you all want to come up here. And impartation, as you guys come up, impartation is not anything that we have. As you guys continue to meditate, marinate, believe in this. Over this next week, God will show you where you're already stepping up some of your destiny. In my life, God gave me a dream in the night in 2014, and he showed me a dream of a school. It's a long time ago, and I did the Joseph thing, and I wrote it down, 
and I handed it off to everybody I could think of to kind of help me with it. And nothing, nada. I got one message back from one leader saying, hey, I would love to help you, but I can't. Everyone else, not nothing, not a response. Friends, like, oh, that's nice, but how are you going to be able to afford that? Because it's a school that's free, and it would send students to four different nations a year, and they wouldn't pay anything for the school. We've gotten caught up in charging every buddy, everything, and we lose what faith is. Because if the leaders can't live by faith, how do they expect to impart into the students by faith? And God showed me how it would all flow. And over these last two years, I started to see God showed me where he's already starting to build this ministry. And everyone was thought it was crazy because I traveled over 400,000 miles in my little Honda Civic going to and fro all over the America. And then he would send me to four nations a year to show me that he could. And then he would, took Edie with me and he showed me that we could go as a team. And then we took three or four people on teams and we didn't have no money, we didn't have jobs. But God showed up in each and every place, even to the degree that we only had $300 for three weeks for three people in a prominent place in Brazil, and yet God still showed up. And I just want to, I just feel like I want to share with you that your dreams aren't going to happen tomorrow, but today there's something that we can do to co in with God, to allow him to build a character in you that's going to sustain the dreams that God's putting inside of you. And so we built all these relationships all over the world. And this school is going to be massive, and I know that it's a dream from God, and it will happen. Hell and high water will get out of the way because God gave me that dream in the night so that I wouldn't forget it. And he won't let anyone else touch it because he doesn't want it changed. He wouldn't let another ministry speak life into it because he wanted it for himself. And he wants to show the world that he can do this out of someone who thought they were nothing. And I just want to impart that into you, that if God can do that in me, he can do it in you. He can send you all over the world in a heartbeat, but you got to co-heir with him today. And when he says, do something, go and do it, but also check the spirit, because sometimes we're not listening to the right spirit. And we can say, hey, did Jesus come in the flesh? It's one of the easiest ones. And the enemy will say no. The enemy loves for you to chase your tail. He will love for you to do amazing things for God, but not do the great thing that he has for you. He gets a lot of busy work that he's been keeping the church in. And if we wait on him and we just start walking out what we have today, he'll show us how to walk it out tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And like with Heidi Baker, God told her to build a university. And it didn't start that day. It actually started probably 10, 15, 20 years prior when God told her to go get a doctor degree because he knew she needed that to have a university. And then to build a school, it took at least 12 years. And if you would look at their life right now, since they've opened the university, they've endured two hurricanes, floods, ISIS, we think we have trouble. We have nothing compared to what they deal with. And, and they're still trying to run a university, trying to feed thousands and thousands of people. And they're trying to take everything the enemy needs for harm and allow God to do something greater. And it's exploding on the enemy's face. So everything the enemy's doing in your life today that is trying to destroy you, when you let God turn it around for good, watch him 
devour the enemy instead of the enemy devouring you. Because he will if you let him. So God, I thank you, Father God, for what you're doing for this entire group. I thank you, Father God, that they are going to allow you to bend them. They are going to allow you to put them in your pocket as a quarter and spend them the way you want to, to be spent. I thank you, Father God, that they will be laid down lovers. They will be leaders to run into all the nations, whatever that looks like, whatever career path you take them on, whether you have a call them out of their career or you send them flaming into their career. But they will know you and signs and wonders will follow them. And it will be no other love. God, I thank you, Father God, right now, just pour out mightily and powerfully. And as we go through this week, I thank you, Father God, for amazing dreams in the night to help them understand what you're doing in the day. In Jesus' name.